Stephen Bailey is the British design guru who takes his vision of industrial creativity into the realm of aesthetics. He isn't automatically convinced by the next twist of fashion in interior decorating, and if he doesn't like some overpriced maniac's latest brainwave in molded plastic furniture, he may try to attack it with a road drill. On the other hand, nobody is more susceptible to the functional beauty of aircraft and automobiles, a passion I share with him, although he has a sympathy with Detroit-style stylistic extravagance that can sometimes worry me almost as much as my random selection of socks must worry him. I already found him admirable before he walked off the job of filling Britain's ill-fated Millennium Dome on the grounds that somebody should have figured out what the thing was for before it was put up. He has the knack of getting in ahead of everybody with values that turn out to be permanent. The only problem is to slow him down. Stephen, I, your whole approach to beauty and aesthetics, when I read your writings and when I read about you, it rings a bell and I, I flatter myself that it's a a bit like my approach, and it may have started at about the same time in childhood. Let me guess, I got a big aesthetic kick out of my first dinky toy aeroplanes. I had a Hawker Tempest II with a little propeller. I used to hold it up and, and, and tilt it, and it, it looked beautiful. Is that where beauty starts for you with? <coughs> well, I suppose it was. I mean, uh, it's got a number of different sources. I was, um, I was, uh, I suppose I was a lonely, only child. And um, I took refuge in, um, you know, in the company of my father, who always had you know, quite nice cars. And I mean, there are no, there are no, there are no early photographs of me with teddy bears or stuffed toys. But there are photographs of me sitting on the, you know, sitting on the mud guard of a huge Georges Roche Talbot, and this is a the headlamp, embracing a headlamp at the age of, you know, three. It was a real car, not a little thing. No, 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 yeah, the real <laughs> thing. I think very, very, very early on, I, um, I. I Began to associate, you know, fine, you know, fine vehicles with be beauty. I also remember, yeah, my father always had nice cars, and, and cars have always had an association of pleasure, mm. uh, you know, for me. Just like you know, Stendhal once said, "What is it? You know, you know that, that, that um, you know, beauty is an anticipation of, you know, of, of pleasure." And I got that uh, out of being in a car. My father also used to work in the uh, aircraft industry, and I used to, you know, on weekends I used to get. Um, it sounds like a it sounds like a torment, but I used to enjoy it. I used to get dragged around aircraft factories, looking at early versions of the Folland Nat or Trident, you know, undercarriages and hydraulics. And it it um, it sounds a wee bit forced, but it wasn't. I actually just genuinely began to you know loved and respected you know these machines. Only later, you know, in, in, in my mid to late teens, did I realise that there was an entire you know body of thought which 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 was in the twentieth century, which was trying to justify you know the appreciation of of these things. But I happily I got it really really. You know, intuitively. I mean, I learned about you know aesthetics from taking an interest in cars. I was never particularly interested in the mechanics of them or the mechanics of flight, but I just, as you said about your Hawker Tempest, you can look at a little model plane and what an amazingly complex formal arrangement For me, that is. More interesting than almost you know, any sculpture that I met later. Yeah, you know, the very the very first thing I wrote was about nine, or, and it got rejected, of course. Was in the, was in about nineteen sixty seven for the BBC's then magazine called The Listener and I was a, I was a you know I was a pushy schoolboy with no you know with no skills and too much ambition and Vauxhall had just introduced uh, what was then the, the the new Vauxhall Viva which had Raymond Lowry's famous coke bottle curve over the you know over the over the hip line it was it was a sort of crass bit of car design but it fascinated me because it's sculptural complexity and the first thing I ever tried to write was that saying that yeah this was actually you know, had it, it was more aesthetically complicated than most stuff which passes as you know as modern sculpture. Well, you say it's a body of thought throughout the 20th century, and it, it is, but it always had to struggle against the idea that aesthetics was the property of art, the recognised <coughs> arts. And in fact, it's still a, regarded as a conceptual breakthrough for anyone who appreciates the fine arts to admit that machinery can be beautiful. Example, and of course, a lot of people don't admit it. So what is natural to you and me is by no means natural to your average run-of-the-mill no. aesthete. Yeah, well, I think one of the things which defines contemporary art is it's not about aesthetics. You know, I mean, art is, you know, I mean, it, it, it might be about other interesting things, but, you know, you can hear a modern artist, the sort of person who will populate you know, Tate, Tate Modern, he'll talk about anything, but he won't talk about beauty, because beauty is no longer, you know, People part of... People who know what, Nicholas Sirota. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, be, you know it's, it's, all, you know, it's about many things, but beauty is not one of them. And that's, you know, that's, that's the bandbox which I, you know, which I'm yeah. standing on. Art is, you know, there's a constant human desire for art, a constant human capacity for it. I mean, we, you know, we want it, we need it, but it's fugitive. It, art takes refuge in, you know, in different media. I'm not saying that cars are, or aeroplanes are works of art, but they are, but they've actually usurped, you know, you know, you know the role of art in teaching, you know, the public about aesthetics. Well, they us usurped that role in my mind. And even today, I measure things by the beauty of the Spitfire, for example. Mm. It tended to come out of Britain when I was young. 
even at the time, of course, I think on a world scale, Britain was starting to lose it to America. America was going to be the big cultural influence. We didn't get, guess that then, but it was true. What, what did America hit you? Uh, uh, I mean, in terms of shapes and designs. And well, again, there are two things. Once again, like uh, as Floyd would have recognised, they're all rooted in childhood. But it wasn't about the sort of defecation stimulating the genitals. In my case, it was about again, slow down again. Again, <laughs> again about it so wasn't. <laughs> no, well, again, it was a bit about well, defecation I'm kind of glad stimulating to hear that. Actually, the Floyd has a strong point. <laughs> But I was much more interested in cars, you know, in cars and aeroplanes. Again, America, yeah, two things really. I um, I had an uncle who'd been an academic in the United States, and, uh, and I was you know, I was brought up in the fifties. You know, when I was a tiny baby, there was still rationing in um, you know in, in Britain. It was gen you know, genuine privation. He came back from the United States with huge fr you know, frigid airs and you know and Vauxhall because he had a because you know, he was uh, related by marriage to a, one of the most amazing guys who ever lived. You know, somebody called Harley Earl, who the, right. the you know. The, the man who used to live next door to Cecil B. DeMille and founded General Motors Art and Colour Section. That's what it was called. Which was is a 19, great 1927, yeah. Which we now think of as a great creative way. Absolutely, mm -hmm. but it was just, you know, Harley Earl was the person who just realised, it, it sounds like complex now, he, he just realised that by making cars you know, more attractive, by giving them yeah. sort of semantic value, you might sell a few more. But when I was young, it was still regarded as a given that American design, especially of things like automobiles, was inherently vulgar because it was decorative. In other words, form wasn't following function. There was a kind of Puritanism in the air that came through Britain uh, from Europe, the old Europe, from the Bauhaus, I think, mm. that form and function uh, uh, should follow each other so closely that it was like a tight oh, suit. I the idea that you could actually have a big volume of metal on a, on a car, like an American car, and all this decoration on it, uh, when it happened, was regarded as a bit of a joke. I actually never thought it was a joke. I realised it was beautiful, but it was b it was by no means a austere. The thing was an extravagance. It was mm. meant to be an extravagance. It was a display. Well, yeah, it was. Um, you know, the critics of that American performance they called it sort of you know planned on lessons, but the guys doing it called it the dynamic economy. Can mm. you know, and. Um, you know, I mean, one of Harley Earl's associates said, you know, talking about you know, cars going out of fashion after one year and, and, and so this, you know, what the Europeans regarded as uh, meretricious change. The uh, Germans called it Detroit Machiavellismus. One of Harley Earl's associates saying, we haven't depreciated these cars. What we've done is appreciate your mind. Yeah. You know, you know, for this glorious, you know, it was it was vulgar well, uh, and excessive. But then you've got to remember as well that you know, yeah, Britain was puritanical, but the des whole design mentality and influence was influ uh, Britain, Britain was, was influenced by it was inf it influenced by the arts and crafts morality. It was Britain influenced by that uh, that that belief that trade was vulgar, making money was you know, making money, you know. You know, was obscene. The Design Council in London put all sorts of things on display during its influential periods. When the Design Council was created to, you know, by well, you know, by well-meaning bien pensant you know, liberals to to educate the, you know, to educate the public into so they could avoid errors of taste. They never ever ever put an American car no. on. And ne never mind that you know, you know, the the, the, the uh, you know the the Roman Empire of the 20th century will be remembered by the 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air. That wasn't considered. You know, it wasn't considered. You know. Um, you know sufficient chaste you know uh, European design but form and function the idea of forms and function form and function that was a fiction anyway yeah. form and function just works if you're using simple materials like you know stone you know and wood mm. you know and iron as soon as you get into something slightly more slightly more complicated like plexiglass I mean what or you know, metal. just yeah. metal you shape yeah, metal yeah and truth the, 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 the Mayflower <coughs> and these other hideous little British cars actually sh were shaping metal they just weren't shaping it away <laughs> well, yeah, well, also but yeah exactly but technology you know, technology always dictates I mean the, you know you know what artists can do one of the reasons why Harley Earl was able to get into these extraordinary sculptural things and, and to do the tail fins and the massive curvatures is because US steel started producing uh, uh, sheets of steel which are 48 inches wide hitherto they've been very narrow so you restricted just to making sort of you know yes. re relatively geometric shapes but anyway, when they got strip steel, you know, it's sufficiently wide, they could indulge their sculptural fantasies. Not often fantasies. enough made. It's the advance in materials between the 19th century and the 20th century that made it possible to build hideous buildings. <laughs> Before that, you couldn't, because there was only a limit to how ugly you could be with bricks. <laughs> There's no limit to how ugly you can be with reinforced concrete. So the material changes the climate. But just, just let me get back for a second to the state of the question of the relative wealth of the, the two countries. We're taking Britain as, and America as paradigms, but uh, America was indeed was an absolute. Um, Britain was a poor country, so uh, a standard object uh, for comparison would be one of those British small cars. America was a wealthy country, and those big cars had a function. It, first of all, it was a, it, there were the highways needed a big engine. 
the, 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 interstate, the interstate needed a V8. Well, absolutely. Well, Britain didn't have an interstate. But yeah, yeah, but absolutely, roads dictate. The roads in any country betray. Uh, you know the cultural preoccupations, you know, you know, of the nation. You've got to stand on on top of a hotel in Detroit, Henry, you know, Henry Ford's home, and you look over the vastness the of, the, of the of the of the Midwest. Yeah. And in America, a road is something you get on, which has a destination at the other end. I dare say it's the same in Australia too. But in Europe, a road, I mean, roads don't have roads are coagulated. You know, I mean, you know, fra in Europe, coagulated fraught, and then it, roads aren't about destinations. They're just about you know maneuvering around you know, maneuvering around obstacles. You know, and Henry Ford said one of the truest things about. Henry Ford said lots of amazing, interesting things, but I think uh, one of the ones which motivates me and why it, it's about the magic of the motor car. The mo magic of the motor car is it's not just about you know, sex and prestige and speed, although these things are certainly important. Henry Ford once said that you know, I had to invent the gasoline buggy, which is what he called it, uh, just to escape the mind-crushing tedium of life on a Midwest farm. Yeah. And that's what the, you know. That's what the motor car is doing. For, it's still, you know, you look outside the window here. There are people, you know, coagulated and stuck in traffic. But that vista of escape, you know, still exists. And that's what's really inherent in the car. And that's that's what powers it, not just V8 engines. Now, I don't think Britain has lost it in the sense that it has been uh, it has been obliterated by American culture. I don't think that's possible. I think Britain has its own identity, but it ceased to be the the leading power for influence in the world, isn't that so? Um, America finally does that. America is finally what determines the world's look. Um, yeah, I think so. un un unquestionably. Again, it's like uh, it's like the Roman Catholic Church did in, you know, in the Renaissance. You've either got the church or you've got IBM, yes. you know, or you've got Xerox, Kodak, Ford, you know, Ford, General Motors, and, and Boeing, McDonnell, Douglas, you know, uh, you know, and and the rest of them. You know, great artists have always gone, you know, have always gone where the money is. When you incorporate the beauty of machines and made objects, industrially made objects, into your aesthetics. Uh, you really have said what is necessary to say about the modern age we live in. But it leaves you with the question of what you think of the people who don't do that. And you are actually very suspicious of aesthetic puri pur purism in every field, including, for example, interior design. I think you'd rather have your interior design done by someone uh, who, on the whole, wasn't an interior designer. <laughs> Isn't that so? If you have spoken against interior design... Well, as if so. I think... I, you know, I'm... Fundamental aesthete. I think things, you know, I think the look of things matters. I think if you don't care about the look of things, you'll care about, you know, no, very, very little. Well, but I mean, you don't trust a I lot of the people who actually set themselves up as, 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 as designers. Well, people interior interior design, or uh, I think, is a bit of a problem. It seems to me to be you know, a sort of moral travesty to, you know, to, to, to hire somebody else to, 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 you know, to, to, you know, to, you know, to organise the way you you express yourself. I think part of the fascination for me is of the modern world. Uh, is that no no gesture is a mute one. There's no such thing as there's no such thing as, as neutrality. You you can't you know just even a uh, there's no there's no there's nothing value free. You can't say I don't like fashion, so I'll, I'll go around walking na you know, so around my naked. Shoes are, my shoes are a statement. Actually, my I'm shoes are. I'm afraid they are. I'm afraid they are. Yes, there's, that they are. there's that wonderful observation about of Jay McInerney's in one of his novels. I just want to hold my shoe up here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to make sure it gets on. Did you know that in New York people won't judge you by you know, your accent for your school mm -hmm. but they will judge you by yeah, your yeah. shoes? Well, they've uh, been, been taught to do that. I want to raise the name of one designer, and I hope it's a red rag to a bull, because I know <laughs> you've gone into print about this man, but I've got my own opinions about Philippe Stark, and I want to vent them before you do. Uh, Philippe Stark is, I think, is what the French don't call, but we should, he's un wonker. <laughs> he's un wonker in the sense that his, his chairs, for example, can't be sat on. I once did an interview with Ines de la Fessange in Paris. I just throw that one in, as one does. Uh, it was in the Café Coste, which had been designed by, designed, big quotation marks there, designed by Philippe Stark. And it was full of his famous three-legged chairs. And unless you sat down in one of these chairs very, very slowly, you fell out of it. Unless you weighed what Ines de la Fessange weighed, which was like four stone. And she sat down very gracefully. And I sat in my chair to interview her, and out I went, to the side, out of shot. We had to start again. And I thought at the time, I was recovering down in the toilet, and in the Philippe Stark toilet at the Café Cost, you couldn't tell the urinal from the hand basin, which can be very awkward if you were <laughs> doing the wrong thing in the wrong place. And I thought, the guy who designed this is a maniac. And I want to ask you about this guy. Why is anyone paying him, or am I being, and it's quite possible, considering the shoes I wear, am I being hopelessly unstylish? Um, I think Philippe Stark's an interesting case study. I mean, he's um, he's he, of course he represents the cult of the celebrity as it as you know, as it affects designer, and I love the, uh, the designer. 
And I'd love that John Updike remark about celebrity. You know, celebrity is a mask that eats the face. Yeah. Um, you know, never, never, never a truer word. I mean, I feel about I mean, design. You know, whatever have you, however defined, I mean, the organisation of practical things. I mean, seeing aesthetic value in the everyday. Well, you know, whatever. That, how it, there are lots of different definitions. Intelligence made visible. Le Corbusier mm -hmm. called it. That's you know, that's what I think design is. You know, it's a, I, there's no gain saying the importance of that in the contemporary world. Um, but I think designers were at their most influential and important when they were least well known. You know, we were talking about Detroit in the 50s or, uh, you know, or Italy in the 60s. We don't really, unless you're an expert in the field, know the names of the or great, de of the the great two, designers. The two back here. We've only just found out Yeah, who yeah, yeah, exactly. What's his mean, name again? Uh, uh, Harry Beck. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, an but I didn't know that when I first but saw it's the a It's a work of organisational, like Goethe said, genius is putting form on the indeterminate. If, if, if you've actually seen the reality of the London tube map, it looks like somebody just spilled spaghetti on the floor. I mean, really, it's a complete mess, changing levels, bends and things, but just, just that organisational genius, organizational genius of Beck made it utter, utter clarity. But Stark has done something, you know, Stark represents something else. Stark represents, if you like, the absolute triumph of that sort of rather confused 80s design sensibility, which in a sense, um, you know, I represent <laughs> and was partly responsible for. He's a, he's a person of prodigal. Talent yes. and a bit of mostly, and you know, mostly in self promotion. But you know, he has he has a prodigal, you know, he has a pro prodigal you know, visual talent as well. He can he, he's inventive, um, you know, he's creative. But he seems to me to be there seems nothing wrong with what he does because they're all just one liners, you know, one liners, you know, one liners. Have you ever stayed at the Royal the exhausted. Royalton in New York? I have actually. I used to know the Royalton before it was Philippe Stark, oh. and in which case it was it was a magnificent. Old school, you know, old school you American hotel. You could tell hotel. it was a hotel because now, well, if you walk past it, yeah. you can't tell the co you can't see the reception desk. He's recessed it, right? No, I was going to say he used to have a Norman Rockwell style diner, yeah. you know, in the basement and a vast black major domo and you know, Egyptian eight yeah. you know, stuff, and it was really oh, a hotel. appallingly seedy. Yes. you know, I, you know, last time I stayed there was you know just before you know, it got Philippe Stark. Uh, you know, the most expensive suite in the Royalton was ninety dollars, yes. and it had sort of and it used one of those hotels which had book matches in it, but they were book matches from another hotel. You know, and there was one or two of them <laughs> had been you know had been used. <laughs> Philippe Stark it, 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 he's the perfect example of the cult of the designer because he, he, he creates stuff which is um, great for being photographed. It, look, it photographs brilliantly. It gets in the stores. You know, people notice it. As I said, they're fantastic one-liners. But for me, enduring design is meant to be. Is, it's more than you know. It's more than a one. It's more than a one-liner. His current his current favorite thing is called the, the Louis Ghost chair. It's transparent. You know, polycarbonate. Uh, you know, a sort of. You actually, but you've been photographed cutting it in half. No, but the chainsaw. Yeah, I wanted to make. Just, I just wanted to make. You know, make you know, make, make a gesture. Well, the chainsaw about it. was probably better designed than the chair. It might. Well, be. yeah, ab you know, yeah, absolutely right. But you know, polycarbonate. It's, it's it's sort of it's funny for you know for yeah. a week or so. But I don't want design to be. You know, you know, uh, it's, it should last. You know, no, for more than a week. Let's but, then, but then you have just what, just what I said. That I, what struck me the other day that one of the cent what, one of the central there's a central paradox in the whole business of being interested in design, and, and I think it's this. And it, 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 in a sense, Stark's an example of it. Uh, designers, by their very nature, want to change things because they always think they're smarter than you are, and they, and they, they can change your, you know, you know, change your life, change your products. Uh, but they're also looking for permanent values, and there's, a, there's clearly a conflict of interest there. I'm going to change it, but I'm also seeking, you know, seeking permanence, yeah. and that's what makes the subject so so baffling and exasperating and fascinating. Well, I'm of the generation where you could still be a slob, <laughs> and yet be interested in the arts. In fact, that was almost a condition of being interested in the arts, <laughs> as you didn't care about yourself and your personal appearance. And I'm starting to wonder whether I didn't make a mistake about that. Now we can, we can, we can play ourselves out here on a clear disagreement, is that I would call you a dandy in the <laughs> sense that, that you dress very plainly, plain suits and everything, but you pay great attention to the, the details, like, uh, the right buttons, the right, the right shoes, the right socks and everything. You, you do care how you look, and I learned early on that it made no damn difference to me whether I cared how I looked or not, because I was always going to look like a slob, so I learned to dress in black because that doesn't show the dirt. <laughs> uh, and I've missed out on something, haven't I? I've well, I wouldn't say that you've missed out on something if it, if, if it suits you, and, and, it, and, and, and it does. <laughs> that's the world, that's the world, damn the world big knows. of you. <laughs> no, no, I think, it's, I, I, th I think it's unseemly to be too concerned with fashion. Um, but, no, but for me, it's what I said before that, you know, it, that every gesture, you know, you know, carry, you know, carries meaning. I think it's. For, I had a huge row the other day. On, I think probably on a radio or television program with the, the guy who's the, uh, the 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 rector of the Royal College of Art. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the most the the, um, the 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 world's oldest and most senior design school. And I said, "What's that shirt you're wearing?" 
And he said, no, I don't know. I just put up, you know, put on what I, you know, you know, what the first thing I found in the morning. And he said, don't you find that odd, really, that you're trying to educate the world about, you know, about matters of design. You don't even know what you're wearing. How do you take it? Badly. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> well, I just think it completely undermined any, any, any you know, any, 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 any credibility he might, yeah, have, he, he, might he might do the two have clung to. <laughs> have clung to. Well, that well I think he was a little bit flustered. But he's like, for me, design, you know, art. You know, as it, I, it I, goes I, to the root. Yeah, art is art doesn't end at the front door of the Tate Gallery. Art is you know, that's the excitement of, you know, of yeah. the modern world. Everything, everything we do, say, wear, buy, drive. You know, you know, betrays our you know, our preoccupations and our and our beliefs, and uh, it's the same with the um, I think same with the shirt you wear. Does it come from a from a feminine principle? Well, there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's a, uh, um, a new study in America, which is currently um, you know, currently quite controversial by uh, somebody called Luann Brazeldine or something, which is I about the female about the female about the study, female brain, yes, yes. and it's about the influence of estrogen on well, on the female brain and testosterone on the male brain. And what makes it controversial and, and is she actually goes for the idea that women, the women are different. Yeah. Chemistry, yeah, chem yeah, chemistry determined yeah. Uh, determines character. But, the, but uh, her book includes lots of interesting research. They pointing out that yet that young female children actually look at things. Yes. Much more than, than you know than, than you know than, than the boys do. By the time they're, I, I can't remember what the figures are. But the time, I saw by the time yes. they're three or four, they spend eighty percent more time making eye contact with you know uh, you know these you know the, I you know one of the most successful articles I've ever written was a few years ago in the Observer. What I wrote, I, it was when I just bought this suit actually. I was wearing a pink shirt on that, on, on that I occasion. I envy that suit. And the, ed and, the edit and the editor of the of, of, of the Observer. Um, said to me something rather similar to you know, what you said. He said, "Good Lord, it's a nice suit." You know, which I, I must get one. Like that. And he said, "Why don't you write about the suit?" And what I wrote about was this thing, saying, "It's not an entirely original idea, but it's a very powerful one." And it's all to do with estrogen and testosterone. And I just said to him that, "Look, in all things apart from sexual preference, because I just I'm only interested in women. I am entirely gay." Uh -huh. And I wrote an article about yeah. that. I got the great idea. I got yeah. the largest post bag yeah. I I've, I've ever got. And you know, people saying. God, at last, some, at last somebody said it. We can have, you know, we yeah. can have, we, 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 we can have scent. We can wear orange shirts and matching socks and, and not be um, not, not be dismissed as a screaming faggot. I'm for it. I just, I, I just can't. You do can't it. do it. Yeah, I can't do it. <laughs> there is such a thing as as decent moral people who aren't interested in the art at all, and I think we have to hang on to that idea. Otherwise, we 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 get into a an, a semi-fascist corner of thinking where we think people have to be educated to a certain degree or they aren't intelligent. It's not true. They're intelligent first, are they not? Well, I think that, let me answer it this way, as the politicians say, I think that you, you can make quite a plausible argument that art is bad for you, or at least art attracts you know, I mean, disagreeable personalities. It tends to attract... Uh, you know, um, disagreeably, you know, disagreeably rich people. You know, you know, fascist, you know, fascist dictators. And my own experience of art being bad for you is this: I mean, because I'm a, you know, because I'm a sort of democratic modernist ideologue, I like to feel that, you know, that, you know, that everybody is is driven by this powerful aesthetic sense, that, that, and that close, you know, you know, proximity to beautiful objects is a life enhancing and life improving experience. Yet I worked for six years in London's Victoria and Albert Museum, you know, a treasure house with perhaps more access to beautiful objects from all civilizations and all ages than anywhere else on earth. You know, I mean, a hauntingly magnificent stuff. And the staff in the Victorian Museum are more miserable, backbiting, vicious, cynical, you know, uh, you know, bunch of individuals. You could not find continuous access to great art did not in any way enhance their personalities or make them into better people. Well, that raises the question of, of jobs. <laughs> it raises the question, why bother? <laughs> no, <laughs> well, it raises the question of jobs, because you've you had several, and they're usually running museums, running institutions and so on. Let me and getting um, sacked from them. And getting sacked yeah. from them, and sometimes at the right time, which raises, for me, the, it doesn't raise the question of, it raises the actual Millennium Dome. <laughs> I, want to, I want to talk to you about the Millennium Dome and your, your relation to it and what it tells you about Britain. For me, I'll tell you what it means as an Australian visitor and an Australian visitor who's lived here for 40 years, but I do come from a country that at least could run the Olympics, you know, <laughs> and I wonder if London can, and the reason the doubt is in my mind is because the Millennium Dome, which seemed to me to be at the, at the, the end point of a long line of British failure that goes all the way back to p the post-war period, 
when Britain started building the wrong things, the, the mm. Bristol Brabazon, the Saunders Row Saro princess flying boat that nobody wanted. There's something distinctively British about that. But the British, are, it's quite clear to me, his, taking the long historical view, what the British have been good at. The British are good at you know, distribution and administration, you know, mm. you know the empire, and, and what went with that, you know, uh, you know, the communications businesses and, you know, retail and advertising. It's all part of the same ability. What the British are appalling at is, is manufacturing. The British only ever led in manufacturing, and the Germans and the Japanese and the Americans, we know, weren't active in it. As soon as competition appeared, I mean, British, you know, British leader manufacturing atrophied overnight. The British, there's also something about the British personality which makes, um, makes them unsuited to the grand gesture, you know, the traditional, you know, self-facing modesty, which is really bollocks. But the Millennium Dome... Uh, the millennium dome. No, I thought no, we could I, have avoided I, I want to get you back to it, because it was a deliberate attempt to symbolise Britain's greatness in the way that uh, so architecture in Liverpool actually does. Yeah. The Millennium Dome, I thought, conspicuously didn't. I, don't, I find it actually quite a dull building. It's not very impressive. But as a, as a feat of organisation, it was worse than unimpressive. What was your relation to that? Just clarify. The basic facts were I was sitting in my well-designed offices in Chelsea, you know, the sunlight flooding in one, one Friday afternoon, I had my feet on my desk, because if you have your own business, you can put your feet on your desk. And I got a call from a guy I knew who worked for the Saatchi Advertising Agency, and he said, have you heard about this Millennium, you know, project? And I, I, nothing existed, the, you know, then. I, I said, yeah, all I know is what I read in the papers. And he said, well, look, they need a creative director. I said, oh, that's very interesting, what does that mean? And he said, well, come along and see us. I went along to see them and um, basically said, look, we've got, a, you know, we've got a billion pounds to spend and you know, we've got this project. We're pretty much stuck with doing it, you know, uh, but we don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you, know, you, know, you know something about exhibitions and design and that, you know, museums. That, can, can you, I don't know if you really mean it. You can, you know, uh, let me think about it over the weekend. So I, um, I went home to my wife and she gave me what used to be called a very old fashioned look because I'd been involved in enterprises like this before, not always successfully. I had dinner with my best friend and he said, you must be out of your mind to, to even to think about taking it on. So of course, on, you know, the following Monday, I immediately said yes and, and took it on. And it, just, it was just the most fantastic insight into, uh, you know, firstly into the early years of, you know, of, of, of Blair's government. So much so, I mean, this is where the whole style over substance trait you know, comes from there. Yeah. What you said about the building is absolutely right. The building was fine, but it, was very, it wasn't an intelligent modern building. It was something, essentially, in architectural terms, the, 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 the building was 30, the 30 years old. It was, I'm pretty certain it was something Richard Rogers just, you know, when he saw the opportunity coming, he got out of his bottom of his plans <laughs> chest and said, have I got something for you? What do you do with any project like this? You've got to start out with the idea, then the building comes, you know, yeah. arises out of it. The question, this of is how to, the question of how to fill it should the, not yeah, be the yeah, question. Yes, yeah. they're com yeah. completely arsed about face because yeah. they, 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 they had this unmanageably huge you know, structure, which, by the way, in technical terms, is a tent. Yes. But but no but the but the megalomania of the early Blair years required it to be dignified by you know by being called a dome. Of course, a dome is a self-supporting mason, masonry you know, masonry structure. One day when attention. When, one day when people are watching this interview, it will have to be explained to them that Tony Blair used to be Prime Minister <laughs> of Britain, right? and he he was the guy who carried the can. In fact, the Tories actually thought of this thing, didn't they? It was before Blair's time. Anyway, let's leave that aside. Uh, so there, are, I think it was a symbol of Blair's government too, in that it was a big idea that was not thought through, and above all, it wasn't thought what was what, what, what was going to be put into it, and that left you carrying the can. Yeah, well, it was completely politicised. Um, it would be naive to think it wasn't, but it, but it, but it was utterly politicised. Um, it was quite impossible to make any... I mean, to create... You know, I have strongly... I, I'm fascinated by the creative personality, and then, to a limited extent, if it doesn't sound self-aggrandising, I've got one, simply because I believe that any, any worthwhile organisation, whether it's a newspaper or a television production company, whatever, is run by one person who's got a pretty clear idea, you know, you know, of, you know of, of what we should be doing. I have a feeling that the talent to handle talent is the rarest talent. Yeah. The people who, the people who can put talents together and, and make something of this scope are so rare yeah. and it can't be faked. We, we must talk again. I've more than enjoyed this, not just because I've heard some of my own ideas confirmed, but because I think you've taken a course in your life that is... That, that, that is adventurous and says an awful lot about what Britain has been and will become and about the world. And I can't say more than that because we've run out of time. Stephen Bailey, thank you very much. Well, thank you.